Good morning. Today is what is today? Today is Tuesday, April the 20th. And welcome to the board of Multnomah County Commissioners, our Tuesday informational board briefing. In accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th, 2020, and extended by the board of county commissioners on December 17th, today's meeting is being held virtually. I want to thank everyone for bearing with us through any technical difficulties that may arise throughout our virtual meeting today. Please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking. And before you present, make sure to check that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. I ask presenters to remember that the public may be listening via telephone, so please state your name before responding to questions. Our first briefing this morning is on COVID-19. Welcome, public health team. Jessica Guernsey. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Kafori and um, Board of County Commissioners. Um, Jessica Guernsey, your Public Health Director, on a beautiful April morning, I'm here to bring you an update on our COVID-19 work and numbers. And I'm joined by our Health Officer, Dr. Jennifer Vines. And I believe we have a slide deck. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> So this morning we're going to do our um, kind of standard run of show. Um, want to bring you some updates around what we're seeing in our numbers locally. Um, touch a little bit on schools and obviously um, bring um, some information updates around our vaccine um, efforts. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Vines. Great, thank you, Jessica. Good morning. Madam Chair and Commissioners, for the record, my name is Dr. Jennifer Vines. I'm your Multnomah County Health Officer. Uh, and I'm going to start by just giving you a, a picture of where we are uh, in this narrative of the pandemic with uh, slides that will look familiar, but that I'll just talk through briefly. Tasia, if you could advance. Great, so here's our, uh, our epi curve. This shows you um, cases, and you can see that our cases are trending up. Um, so we are looking at about what we looked like uh, in the middle of last July. Um, and this is true across the region. So we've had a week over week uh, increase. Um, but hold that thought, because I'm gonna show you some other, um, other ways to think about what's happening. Next slide, please. So this is percent positivity. So as you all know, this takes into account the volume of testing, which you can see has stayed relatively stable over the last several weeks. Um, but there again, we see an increase in percent positive. Um, so total number of tests positive over total number done uh, also uh, reflects what we think is happening, which is an increased spread of disease. Next slide, please. So here are hospitalizations. And as, as I've said before, this is uh, one of the North Stars of COVID response. So hospitalizations tend to lag behind uh, increase in cases. You can see here that we're fairly low, although we have seen an increase uh, in the metro area. Um, there are a lot of questions about whether age among hospitalized is trending down. The answer looks like probably yes. Um, the numbers are, are low enough that we can't draw firm conclusions, um, but it does look like, um, it does look like the, the median age uh, is, is starting to come down. Um, that's to be expected uh, in some ways because we've, uh, prioritized our highest risk elders uh, in the vaccine effort. Uh, we've seen outbreaks in long-term care facilities uh, drop incredibly. Um, and we also have presence of variants. And so right now, according to Oregon Health Authority monitoring, um, the most common variant by far in Oregon is what's called the California variant, which is thought to be about 20% more contagious, uh, an order of magnitude lower than that. Uh, is the so-called UK variant, which is thought to be about 50% more contagious and may cause more severe illness. And then down in the single digits is what's known as the P1 variant. This is the one out of Brazil um, that's particularly concerning because it may actually have features that allow it to escape uh, the immune response from vaccine. So this becomes a numbers game. Uh, as we know, there are still a lot of people in our region who are susceptible to this virus. Um, so as people um, 
start to mix and uh, encounter this virus that is more contagious, uh, we will see spread among younger people and it will find its way uh, into a younger person who has uh, uh, complications and end up, ends up hospitalized. So um, as I've said before, the vaccine is by far um, our biggest effort here to stay ahead of the variants, uh, but we do still encourage people to get tested if they have symptoms so that they can isolate and so that their close contacts also know uh, to quarantine and to watch for symptoms. Next slide, please. I wanted to touch on what's happening with COVID-19 in schools. This is um, the probably one of the biggest developments uh, in the last month is getting our kids back to learning in the classroom. Um, so we expected to see COVID-19 appear in schools. Um, what happens in schools essentially mirrors what's happening in the community uh, as opposed to driving spread in the community. Um, so we are seeing cases in schools. Uh, it's important to know that in Oregon, uh, a school gets called an outbreak if they have one case. So that's an extremely low threshold for an outbreak definition, but it puts it on the public health radar for follow up. Um, and what we do is uh, we, we ask the entire cohort, so the entire group uh, around the positive case to quarantine. And that's, that's certainly a burden for that group. Um, some people may balk at that if they know who the case is and say, you know, I, did, I wasn't truly exposed. That is our approach, though, to, to firewall off additional spread in this school. That's our goal anyway. Um, where we are seeing concerning spread related to schools uh, is in extracurricular and other social activities that happen around having kids together. Um, so sports settings, social settings, that's where we're seeing more transmission. So as we've lent support and guidance to school leadership in bringing kids back, we've been really clear that public health supports um, the safety that can be achieved in a classroom setting and the importance of having kids in the classroom. And we're really working uh, as much as we can to get these other messages out about precautions that our youngsters need to be taking outside of the classroom, which is where we are seeing uh, where we are seeing cases. Uh, next slide, please. Um, let's turn to vaccine updates. I would want to um, just share out probably the biggest update. And I don't know, Chair, if you want to pause here before we turn to vaccine, maybe pause for questions about disease trends. Um, sure. Uh, Commissioner Myron, do you have any questions? No, thanks. Commissioner Becky Peterson? No, thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. I did have a question or concern about the, the P1 variant that you mentioned, Dr. Vines. Uh, can you talk a little bit more? I mean, that's very concerning to me. Uh, can you allay some of my fears about uh, what's going on with that? Um, I can try, Commissioner Stegman. So the, the P1 variant has a couple of mutations or, or changes um, that look like it gives the virus a real advantage in getting around our immune response that's prompted by the current vaccines. So this is one that we're watching closely. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, though, so out of several hundred samples uh, that Oregon Health Authority has collected this information on, four were P1 variants. So it is a small minority right now of known variants in Oregon. Um, I'm hearing generally that the vaccines, especially the Pfizer and Moderna and presumably the others, uh, could be updated to keep pace with the virus, much like uh, flu vaccines get updated yearly. Um, so there is some very early conversation in the public health and immunology worlds about uh, updating vaccines to essentially match uh, these newer versions of the COVID-19 virus no firm plans or anything in the works, but that's where the conversation is headed. Okay, so obviously it's probably too early to tell, but I was just like wondering what that means for people that have gotten, you know, maybe their first vaccine, uh, or what does that mean for people that have gotten both doses? Potentially, would there be like a third vaccine? Um, so I think it's, it's too soon to say, but I, I think that's a possibility. Um, this is why we're 
we're in in sort of this in between phase where people who have been vaccinated have actually gotten a very very good vaccine whether it's Johnson and Johnson and we'll talk about that but if they've had Johnson and Johnson or two doses of Pfizer and Moderna they're very well protected against uh, the the version of COVID that has been most common until recently and so that's why you see things like uh, foregoing quarantine um, and uh, other um, sort of exceptions to some of the public health rules. What remains in place, though, is, of course, masking uh, and continuing to watch for symptoms and signs of illness. Uh, and that's what acknowledges, of course, the uncertainty with these vaccines. Just like with any vaccine, uh, there is not 100 percent coverage. And we, you know, we always encourage people if you're sick, stay home. So don't if you if someone has been vaccinated, they should not ignore uh, symptoms that they develop. They, sh they should seek COVID-19 testing. Um, but at the same time, they're they're reasonably well protected given what we know at this moment in our region. I, I appreciate that, Dr. Vines, because I think, you know, while there's a high level of confidence that the vaccines that we have are very good, like you said, nothing is 100%. Uh, and so, you know, we still have to continue to wear face coverings and, you know, do all the things that we've been doing. Uh, but yeah, this is this is concerning, but I'm glad to hear that the numbers are lower. Uh, and I know it's kind of looking into the crystal ball. So, so thank you for, for, for walking down that path with me. You can keep going. Dr. Okay, Brands. great. Um, so um, Jessica is going to give you a lot of the operational vaccine updates. I just wanted to uh, touch on the, the biggest news, Tasia, if you would advance. The pause uh, last week on the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, so just so just so you all know, this is our single dose vaccine. It works a little bit differently uh, compared to the Pfizer and Moderna. It uses different technology, and uh, it was uh, found through our national vaccine safety system. Uh, six cases of very unusual blood clots in the brain um, among women, mostly younger women, so between 18 and roughly 50 or 60 years old. Um, our vaccine safety system picked up those six cases as unusually high for this specific type of blood clot um, and for the particular manifestation, which looked like it had something to do with the immune response um, and the body's immune response, specifically throwing off the balance of bleeding and clotting uh, in, in these individuals. Uh, uh, some of these were catastrophic. Um, so the decision at the national level was a suspension in use of Johnson & Johnson. Just to be clear, it still is approved under the emergency use authorization. So that was not revoked. So this is a essentially a voluntary pause at the national and state levels uh, while a committee gathers more information about these uh, six cases. I think they've identified an additional two cases but really trying to understand what is the relation uh, to the vaccine? Um, is there, uh, uh, are there sort of warning conditions that we can put in place for who are the best candidates for Johnson & Johnson? Um, and also to get information out to clinicians to be on the lookout uh, for this potential complication because there are uh, specific instructions for, uh, for appropriate treatment. Um, so my understanding is these six cases are, are higher than you would expect uh, just in, in, in the population on, on a given day. Um, when people say it's uh, you know, six cases out of six or seven million doses, so you know they use the one in the million talking point, I would just point out that given that these were in women in a relatively young age group, the risk is actually higher than that because you're, the denominator is doses given to, to women in that age group. Um, so we have, of course, paused uh, use of Johnson & Johnson uh, as you all may recall, it represents a, really a minority of our vaccine supply uh, in the region, but it is a loss. It is a, a good vaccine in terms of keeping people out of the hospital, protecting them from severe COVID, and with a single dose uh, with relatively few side effects, um, it has some real uh, benefits. So at this point, uh, we're waiting to hear from our federal experts. Their next meeting is this Friday, I believe. Um, so everyone will be interested in hearing uh, what they have found from their analysis and what they recommend going forward. Um, I will just say this is our vaccine monitoring system uh, doing its job. Um, and I think this pause is as disappointing as it is to have unused vaccine on the shelf. I think it was uh, definitely the right thing to try to understand what this is 
uh, and how we may need to refine how we use this vaccine to, to minimize the risk of this rare but uh, potentially catastrophic side effect. I think with that, uh, I hand it over to Jessica and I'll be here if you wanna revisit the Johnson & Johnson uh, topic with any questions. Thanks, Dr. Vines. Maybe go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, our vaccination numbers and um, operations, and then we'll have plenty of time um, for questions. Um, so uh, this slide is from the state's um, Tableau dashboard of um, the statewide county by county um, vaccination numbers. Um, so you can see here that we are um, about 52% of adults um, in Multnomah County um, have had uh, at least one dose of um, one of the various vaccines that have been administered um, and about 200,000 um, have been fully vaccinated. Um, so we are, you know, it's it's moving forward. And as Dr. Vine said right now in our public health toolbox, this is extremely important um, in the race um, against uh, COVID and trying to get this out as quickly as possible and in a targeted way. Um, to reach those most impacted, but we are seeing um, a pretty strong uptick over the last couple of weeks that we're very pleased with. Next slide. I think this is just more of the data. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later and go to the next slide. Sorry. So um, I think Dr. Mines already mentioned this, but I'll, I'll say it again as of Monday in Oregon um, and nationwide. Um, uh, Oregonians 16 years of age and older are able to sign up um, for the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. We are continuing to work through the multiple pathways um, for vaccine access across um, the community more broadly. We still have the mass vaccination sites um, run by the health systems. Um, at some point, those will start to shift um, in terms of uh, their capacity and the work they're doing there, but those are still in operation. Um, we've talked multiple times about the um, retail pharmacy access, um, which has increased, but I will say that that's a federal uh, program that we don't have line of sight into the same way that we do um, our statewide um, vaccine uh, numbers and locations. Um, there are many different pharmacies in town that um, have access to vaccine um, through the federal pharmacy system and uh, folks are accessing that. <clears throat> Um, we have additional outpatient settings coming online. That's a strong partner um, for us in public health and making sure we're reaching um, specifically um, BIPOC communities. And I'll talk a little bit about our numbers. Um, and we are starting to see the glimmer of hope around an uh, increased allocation um, for local public health. Um, we're going into a second week of a little bit more vaccine. Um, it's a little bit unclear how consistent that will be, as you all are aware. Um, this has been a little bit of a, a, a board game in terms of understanding what we're going to get when and what kind. So we're still not in a completely consistent um, inventory, um, but it's it's starting to look a little bit better. Next slide. So again, just reemphasizing um, for our allocation in um, public health, we're continuing to focus on um, those uh, communities that are most impacted in the BIPOC, BIPOC and immigrant um, local community, um, really focusing on um, continuing to focus on culturally specific partnerships, um, be it location, uh, working with CBO staff, um, ensuring that we have uh, closed registration to reach folks that um, are really, really, really trying to reach that may not access vaccine in other sites. Um, obviously, we're continuing to focus on um, communities that are highest risk for severe illness, um, exposure, transmission, and outbreak, um, which many of our priority populations um, have started to move through um, in getting to those folks. And then, um, of course, um, ensuring that we've reached all long-term care facilities, corrections, and adult group homes, which we've done amazing work on. Um, and I always like to just say for everybody who's involved in this work, our staff, volunteers, um, Medical Reserve Corps, community partners, this is truly a huge unprecedented effort. And I thank everybody um, who has been involved in this effort. It's been incredible. And then I think last week we touched on, or excuse me, the last briefing we touched on the expansion to um, agricultural workers and food processing plants. 
um, which we have less of in Multnomah County, um, but we are beginning that work as well as our sister counties in the metro area and starting to look at low income senior um, housing, multi generational housing, and continuing to focus on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, shelters and outdoors. So for this week, just to give you an overview of um, what the focus of activities are um, uh, beginning yesterday, um, we are continuing to um, vaccinate adults in custody. Um, we have um, three different BIPOC um, focused uh, vaccine clinics um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then um, Friday, we're using our hub and spoke model to continue reaching out to um, ADD um, and adult care homes um, to finish some of that work off. So that's a little bit of an overview of what's happening this week. Next slide. So um, these are just the general numbers that reflect some of the work that I've just been talking about. Um, and we are fin putting the finishing touches on a vaccination dashboard that will be um, available very soon um, that will go into, it'll fold into our other dashboards um, where that we have on our website that includes looking at our positivity testing and hospitalization rate. But I wanted to go ahead and share the numbers um, that we have, um, even though they're not in the full visualization yet. Um, so. We have received over 98,000 doses of all three vaccines um, in Multnomah County Public Health. Um, a little bit over 60,000 of those vaccines have been redistributed through key partnerships to reach high risk individuals. So this is a big part of our strategy. Um, we cannot do it alone. We have to work with other folks to make sure the vaccine gets out to the right folks. And then for, for public health, We've had a total of 77 clinics, um, about 37 of those clinics have been solely focused on the BIPOC community. Um, and the, the other clinics, um, and I realized yesterday that folks, you know, sometimes either forgot because we've moved so quickly through this um, huge event, um, or maybe don't know that um, a large part of what we were doing on the front end of the vaccination work was um, focusing on that 1A category, which for us in public health did have an equity lens. Um, we focused on groups like community health workers, doulas, um, medical transport teams, et cetera. Um, so some, a good chunk of those um, front end vaccine clinics were focusing on those groups as well as adults in custody, which I just mentioned, that's a responsibility that we have. That's a very important one. Um, continuing to focus on elders, um, specifically in the BIPOC community and um, people experiencing homelessness or houselessness. So this again is a big effort um, for us. And then I also just mentioned the field clinics serving homebound adults or adult foster care. When we look at our overall numbers, I'm pleased to report that of the 15,401 people that we in public health have vaccinated, 75% um, identify as um, BIPOC and actually looking at our numbers um, more recently, because this was gathered last week, it's inching closer um, to 85. So I'm really proud and excited to see um, this reflected, this hard work that everybody is doing reflected um, in our numbers. So that's that's really good news. Next slide. So that is the end of our slideshow and we are here to um, answer any questions. I did wanna mention one thing that I didn't have time to create a slide for, um, but just yesterday I got um, an email confirming um, a very large communications campaign that we're doing with older adults across multiple communities. Um, so I just wanted to say a word about that and I'd be happy to share more information about this um, later, but our fantastic communications team, um, along with our liaisons, um, have produced a large scale um, senior messaging campaign through postcards and ads. And I just received yesterday an update um, the, on the thousands of postcards and ads that have gone out um, in Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Russian, Bosnian, Croatian, Creole, Korean, Tagalog, um, through multiple um, venues um, in community-based agencies, including Meals on Wheels, Impact Northwest, um, Hollywood Senior Center, Asian Health and Service Center, and ERCO. And then we were able to place um, uh, close to two dozen ads across culturally specific um, papers um, and also use WeChat um, and social media. And again, the focus here is um, really uh, making sure that seniors know that vaccine is accessible 
and how they can reach our call center or 211 if they need assistance in getting vaccinated. So I'd be happy to share more of those visuals later, but I did just want to mention because I just got word about this yesterday being finalized and it's a huge effort. Thank you. That's great news, Jessica. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure we would all like to see some of those visuals. So maybe at our next briefing, you could have a couple slides with, with the information that's going out. And we have uh, time for questions and comments from the board. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jessica. I, I did have a question on the vaccine numbers, uh, the second to the last slide. So it looks like we received about, um, let's say, 100,000 doses. And then it says that about 60,000 have been redistributed uh, to our partner agency. So that would leave about 40,000. So just is my math correct then in assuming that we distributed that other 40,000 through the 77 clinics, 37 with a BIPOC focus, is that correct? Yes, and remember that we have, we get the second shot as well, so. Okay, yes. okay. That's great. That's amazing. Awesome. I, thank you so much for for highlighting uh, all of this data, which can be uh, really kind of confusing. But uh, I'm so happy to see that um, we really have executed on our, our values and making sure uh, that we get the vaccine out to those uh, most in need. So thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jessica and Dr. Vines, for this presentation. Um, one question I had about the work that we're doing with um, <clears throat> vaccinating those people in custody is, is I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that and wondering if the, the J and J hold is having an impact on that. I know that that vaccine, because of its one dose, was was really looked for as a great solution for people who might only be in our custody for a few days or something like that. So can you talk a little bit about that? Jen, do you want to do you want to touch on that? I know yeah. you have some. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to answer this question. Thank you, Commissioner Vega Peterson. So when we started vaccinating adults in custody, Johnson and Johnson was not yet widely available. And what we found, which makes total sense, is that uh, one of the ways to overcome vaccine hesitancy among adults in custody was for them to know that they were getting the same vaccine uh, that their corrections health providers had gotten, that their deputies had gotten. Um, and so that actually went a long way uh, in establishing some vaccine confidence. Um, a lot of credit to Corrections Health and other staff for uh, managing the two dose series. It's it's not easy as you can imagine, um, but they are doing the, the best they can in getting the two dose series uh, into the, the people in their custody. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for that additional information. Did you have any other questions or comments, Commissioner Vega Peterson? I do not. Not. I just wanted to thank everyone for the wonderful job they're doing, and I and I do. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about how we can take. I think the work that Multnomah County has done and led with, and making sure that we are working really hard to vaccinate those that are hard to reach, especially those in the BIPOC community, and and how we can duplicate that um, statewide. And I just am really proud of the way that we've done our work and and. Um, the focus that we've put on this and it's pretty amazing i think that we're at the point where we are at we're past the majority of adults in multnomah county who have had at least one vaccine we still have, have a long way to go but um it's such a great milestone that i think we can all um you know take heart in that we we've, we've done a lot of work and it's paying off commissioner Murray. thank you um yeah, I uh, had a couple of questions and appreciate Commissioner Stegman's um, question. I was trying to do the math as well. I'm like, wait a sec, I, <laughs> I remember uh, addition. Um, but yeah, thanks for clarifying those numbers. And um, I just, I had a couple of questions about uh, sort of um, where we are to standpoint and from the standpoint of facilities and additional um, uh vaccination sites uh just thinking um in a, a couple of areas one being schools uh and um i i uh have spoken to jessica and also the chair's office about the um opportunities that are available uh for schools um to as they're really hubs in the community have very aligned values with the county's mission um very connected to 
to um, students and families who might otherwise be not that accessible? And um, have we are we exploring that option of um, having school based uh, clinics, vaccine clinics happening? So we're in the process right now of finalizing some of our what, what we're calling our medium throughput permanent locations, um, sort of like we have at Mount Hood Community College um, that are very strategically located based on our data and community feedback. Um, so we're finalizing um, some agreements um, right now, as you know, we're already at um, PCC um, in uh, Northeast um, and trying to um, make that a little bit more permanent um, for our, our both our um, vaccination and testing work. Uh, we you did connect me with your um, school's contact and we um, are going to have a conversation about that to see where that could fit in in um, this larger conversation. I, I think, you know, down the road, it might be a both and depending on what's available. Um, the timing is a little bit um, odd right now with the school's work um, because we are seeing a um, return to in person instruction. And as Dr. Vines talked about, we are strongly supporting as much um, return to normalcy around schoolwork as possible. That doesn't preclude us from having some sort of arrangement where we could do that. But right now, first order of business is finalizing um, the medium throughput sites where we've done a lot of work and really making sure those are well you know, placed. Um, and then we'll be looking at other options as well. Awesome. Um, the, the other question about sort of um, vaccination facilities or sites, whether they're um, permanent or not, um, but potential opportunities. Um, I'm just curious if there have been uh, any any sites or any clinics that have been done on the west side at all, and do we have any plans for doing any on the west side? We have not. Um, our numbers have been, um, I should take, let me take that back. There's been field work that is not a standing clinic that obviously includes Multnomah County. Um, where we have had obviously some coverage, but for our vaccination sites thus far, um, other than a collaboration with Washington County at the Muslim Education Trust, we have not um, stood up West Side um, clinics, uh, unless you count some of the work that we've done at the McCoy Building, which I wouldn't really count that as um, sort of the community based clinics. We've really focused on um, the gaping, you know, the gap that's been out in Eastern. Um, Portland, East Portland and um, East County, where we really have um, pretty incredible numbers and lack of access for other opportunities for folks. Okay, I, I just I do want to to raise that there are there are so many people um, who don't may not have other opportunities that are in are west of the Willamette River. And I would suggest, you know, places to think about would be the Linton Community Center. There is a huge population of, um, of farm workers who are living in that region and uh, don't have other access. Um, and there uh, also is in the Markham District, we have a mosque there and there are a number of community members who um, also uh, do not have access. And so I would just, ask that you think about having at least just one or two it, have some representation on the west side for some of those really those areas that uh, have been um that are also marginalized um and i i think that that's it thank you jessica guernsey and dr vines thank you so much for coming this morning and as always, appreciate all that you're doing. Have a great day. <clears throat> Next up, we have um, with us the Behavioral Health Division. They will be providing an update on mobile crisis services, as was requested in last year's budget. But before we get to the presentation, I want to take a moment to acknowledge what happened last Friday in Lentz Park. Robert Douglas Delgado, aged 46, lost his life after an encounter with law enforcement that tragically ended in his death. And I want to extend my deepest condolences to his family, to his friends, and to anyone who counted him as part of their community. Mr. Delgado, who his family described as a sweet man, was someone who lived with a mental illness and a substance use disorder. 
And while I recognize that an investigation is underway to gather all the details, uh, we can't simply have an open, honest, or productive discussion about behavioral health crisis services without recognizing what unfolded in Lentz Park just a few days ago and whether it had to unfold that way at all. Living with a mental illness or a substance use disorder or struggling with both requires engagement, building trust, and treatment. And it must not be a death sentence. But a system that leans overwhelmingly on law enforcement to respond to people in crisis with aggression and weapons put people in harm's way. We have seen this so many times. We have seen this too many times. A heartbreaking and infuriating number of times. Without prejudging the findings of the investigation, I can say with confidence that mobile crisis services can be the difference between life and death. These services aren't just an intervention of care and de-escalation. They also offer those who are experiencing a crisis, experience a crisis, a level of protection from irreversible tragedy. Today, we'll hear from experts in the Behavioral Health Division, as well as Cascadia Behavioral Health Care about the existing system, including what's working, why it works, and where there's room to improve. And now I will turn it over to Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, thank you for grounding us in, in the conversation and um, just the the harsh and tragic reality uh, of of what people experience when they're in mental health crisis. Um, you know, last year during the budget process, I uh, proposed this budget note for a few key reasons that I want to reaffirm today. Uh, first and foremost, I think it is really important for us to continuously assess and improve on our services. In the coming years, we'll be in a place to re-procure our crisis system, and a lot has changed in our environment since the last time we did this in 2017. Notably, uh, Portland Street Response has launched, uh, and the legislator, legislature is currently considering some major investment in capacity and infrastructure for crisis services. Um, second, I raise this in part because as we consider ways to truly divest from law enforcement response and reinvest in other services that promote public safety throughout our systems, and uh, you know, as recently we did that with the just in our uh, contract and conversations around transit security um, with TriMet, it's critical that we consider those things that are not in themselves law enforcement interventions but may have an unintended consequence or parallel law enforcement response. That's why this budget note explicitly includes a request to assess data on calls that elicit a law enforcement co-response and or law enforcement follow-up. I wanna better understand the extent to which our current model of mobile crisis response intentionally or unintentionally promotes or de-emphasizes law enforcement uh, response. And um, I, you know, I look forward to uh, to hearing from our uh, behavioral health team and uh, Cascadia about about their work. Thank you. Welcome, Ebony. I think you're kicking this off. Yes. Uh, for the record, my name is Ebony Clark, and I'm the interim health department director. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Myron and um, commissioners for giving us the opportunity to come before you and uh, talk in detail about uh, our crisis services specific to mobile crisis. Uh, along with me today is Julie Dodge, the interim behavioral health director, Krista Jones, who is our senior manager for the community mental health program, Frederick Staten, who is our crisis manager. And then Barb Snow, who's a clinical director of crisis services from Cascadia Behavioral Health Care. In today's presentation, we'll be covering uh, the scope of mobile services, um, mobile crisis services, I should say. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, we'll specifically be focusing on uh, the intersections of Project Respond and the call center, but then also zooming out and looking at the intersection of our full crisis 
continuum. We'll also be working through a review of the data, uh, specifically looking at a three year snapshot, uh, touching on performance measures, reporting requirements, and then taking some time to walk through the evaluation of the effectiveness and assessment measures. Um, in addition to also highlighting um, some recommendations and some possible alternatives, alternative models to mobile crisis, and then ending with also talking about um, what's before us in terms of um, the Portland Street response, uh, the new uh, statewide crisis system, and um, any potential uh, forecasts and intersections with that. So I'll end there and I'll pass it to Julie Dodge. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony, and uh, thank you, Chair Kafuri and all of the commissioners. We are um, privileged to have this opportunity. We're on the next slide now. Um, since I've come into this role in the last three months, one of my mantras has been to ask, what good will it do? You know, that government has an opportunity to do good or to do harm. And so I'm always curious, you know, what good is what we're doing going to lead to? And I think we have that opportunity, you know, now in this time that we are, are living in to consider these things. And as we go through this, the other thing I want to focus on, and you can see the topics that we'll cover on this slide, but who are we here to serve? To place in front of us the real lives and the real people that we're here to serve. So I want to share a story um, of someone who has passed through these services and talk about, you know, what is possible. Um, we had a 37 year old man who had previously been diagnosed with schizophrenia, who was houseless and staying in a shelter. His friends began to become concerned as his behaviors were beginning to escalate. Um, he was becoming agitated. He was seeing people yelling people. And so they began calling um, our Multnomah County call center, which you know, Frederick oversees and manages. And as those calls began coming in the call center, activated Project Respond to go out and see what's going on. So Project Respond went out and uh, found that the that this gentleman had, had indeed was experiencing some really difficult times and placed him on a director's custody hold and took, transported him to the emergency room. At the emergency room, uh, he was assessed and uh, stayed there for, got some stabilization, some medication, and continuously the emergency department and project respond coordinated to anticipate this person's release because as a houseless person he didn't have a safe home to go back to he's going back to shelter so project respond stayed with them um, uh, worked on the discharge planning and building up supports in the community um, had a plan for his exit they actually transported him and continued to uh, set up an emergency intake at Cascadia to get some of his basic needs met, uh, including getting a cell phone for increased connection, activating his behavioral health services team, and then the shelter outreach team stayed with him to be able to make sure that he um, got to his first intake appointments, continue to provide supports while he was in the shelter as he was getting engaged in services. This is the kind of thing that we hope for, that from the beginning, we connect our call center to the appropriate behavioral health response, get someone the level of support that they need so that they can be supported and go back to some level of normalcy, you know, regardless of their circumstances, so that doesn't escalate to a place where other people need to be involved. And as we go through this process, yes, we'll speak to, well, why does that happen? When is law enforcement called? What does that look like? And we're going to be looking at, you know, some of those disparities that we are well aware of, that uh, we know that people who are black and indigenous, indigenous and other people of color have higher rates of um, engagement. We know that certain neighborhoods are impacted more greatly and so we'll we'll cover those things as we go through this. Um, but I wanted to start by say, saying when it works, it works well. And so I'll, I'll pass over to I believe uh, Kristen now. So or Frederick, I apologize. We're going to Frederick Steeton. Or is Julie? We're one team. Don't even worry about it. 
Um, so uh, thank you, Julie, and I, I want to thank uh, uh, Chair Kafore and the Board of County Commissioners for the opportunity to be able to speak with you a little bit this morning. So my name is Frederick Staten, I'm Crisis Services Manager. Uh, I was hired in October of 2020, and prior to that time, I was aware of the call center, but I wasn't aware of the, the historical parts of the call center. It was actually established in 2001, and when you think about what was happening in 2001, it was almost prior to these talks about health integration and prior to these talks about disproportionalities for the BIPOC community. So if we're thinking about healthcare in 2001, it's evolved a lot coming into 2021. And as healthcare has evolved, the call center has also evolved. So we now are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We take approximately 70,000 calls annually. And the calls that we take range. And so some people think we're still just the crisis line. We're not, we have evolved to try to meet the needs of the community, which means that we take a range of calls between crisis calls and other calls for uh, whether it's support or resources in the community, uh, whatever, the, whatever the, the community feels like they need. So as far as the crisis calls, and I do wanna talk about those just for a moment. We do take the crisis calls for Multnomah County. We're contracted through Washington County to take their crisis calls as well. Uh, we take transfer calls from 911 as well as have transfer calls to uh, 911, as well as the mental health police line. When we have calls from somebody who's having a behavioral health challenge, one of the things that we do is can we try to do that. Can we switch to the uh, direct slide? My apologies. I forgot to cue those up. Apologies. Can we get to the next slide, please? Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so, as we're talking about uh, individuals who might be having a behavioral health challenge, we, we want to make sure that we are both trauma informed, embracing, as well as assessing what the need is. So, every call that comes through, if somebody has, is having a behavioral health challenge, we are doing that vetting, we are doing the assessing in the moment. And again, we do that for Washington County, we do that for uh, Multnomah County as well. We also take other calls. So, if you needed to know about resources in your community, you can call the call center. Uh, you, if you want to know, uh, hey, I'm, I'm having some challenges here and I want to know what's in, you can call us. That number is 503-988-4888. Again, it's 503-988-4888. Please, please, please. If you have a question or if you have a concern, it, no concern is too small to call the Behavioral Health Call Center, so please call us. I, I do want to highlight a couple of initiatives just to show the versatility of the call center and how we've evolved over the, over the years. And there were two really cool initiatives that were COVID related we were able to, to participate in. One was the Be Well initiative, and I'm just going to give an acknowledgement to Ebony. Ebony is a visionary who not only believes in leading with race, but also operationalizing what that looks like. And so the Be Well initiative was meant to really help individuals in our community who identified as being from the BIPOC community or uh, residing in Multnomah County and had in, been impacted by COVID. And through that initiative, through people calling into the call center for assistance, I think we helped about 700 families, if I'm not mistaken. And that is just a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, example of not just the leadership within Behavioral Health Division, but also operationalization of what leading with race looks like. The other uh, COVID-19 related initiative that we have, uh, we're participating in now is in relation to the VMOs or the Voluntary Isolation Motel Operation Units. And so anyone that needs uh, quarantining for COVID, the Behavioral Health Call Center is one of those intake lines that people like providers can call us. We can make sure that we, we're getting people what they need as far as COVID goes. And it really, again, speaks to the need to evolve with the needs of the community. COVID has hit all of us. And so it was our way of saying, this is our way of giving the community what they need right now. Now, in addition to that, we're also uh, one of the access points for mobile crisis. And so approximately, I think maybe 7% of our calls do get referred to mobile crisis. And when we would um, uh, contact mobile crisis, it would generally be because someone is maybe a danger to themselves or others. Uh, they may have had a pretty stable mental health history, but maybe they're experiencing kind of a crescendo in, in symptomology, or if somebody is either unable or uh, not at a point where they're um, uh, willing actually to uh, engage in services and they're really having an emergency. Those might be times where we would mobilize our, our, our mobile crisis team through Project Respond. And so uh, I think without further ado, I think what I wanna do is maybe kick this over to Barb 
and she's going to give you a little bit of an overview about Project Respond. Uh, next slide, please. And Barb, I believe you're up. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners, for having me here this morning. Uh, so this slide, I want to give just a general overview of all of the crisis services that Cascadia provides. Um, we initially got the contract to do the crisis mobile response and urgent walk-in clinic in 2001 from the county. And as Frederick just talked about, that evolution that the call center has gone through, we also have gone through that uh, through our crisis services. And you can see all of the different services that we've sort of added over the years here are represented in this in this graph. For the purposes of today and the contract for crisis services, we're really talking about those ones that are um, outlined in black, which are the mobile crisis team, our emergency department liaisons, family crisis stabilization specialists, and peer wellness specialists. So that's all that's included um, in that contract that we're talking about. Uh, Staff-wise, uh, we have just under about 39 FTE that make up these programs. Um, that sounds like a lot when I say 39, but when we break that down into the individual programs, um, it ends up being about 24 crisis clinicians that we have available to respond to mobile crisis. We've got um, you know, admin staff, supervisory support staff, and then uh, about four staff on our ED team, uh, two peer wellness specialists, and two uh, staff with our family crisis stabilization specialists. So when we look at those 24 clinicians or thereabouts for our crisis team, um, we respond in teams of two to crises in the community. We go anywhere, anytime, any place to see anyone um, of any age. Uh, we want to be able to prioritize the care and that trauma-informed intervention that we're providing. So we prioritize trying to get there as quickly as possible, by, but also taking our time to make sure that we have the information we need to approach a situation and to engage with an individual in a way that's going to be most conducive to a productive outcome. We also don't want our clinicians to be rushed once they're there and in the field. We want to be able to spend as much time as possible with each individual we're seeing to really talk about what's happening and resolve the crisis as much as possible. So we use a heat map that shows us uh, kind of where our call volume is to kind of figure out how to do uh, shift work and stagger those teams um, across 24 hours a day, seven days a week and the entire county. Uh, what that ends up looking like is that we have about one team typically from about midnight to 7 a.m. We then start bringing on teams during the day uh, and then those teams start going home again in the afternoons and evenings. So between the hours of about 1 and 6 p.m. is when we're the most heavily staffed that matches with when our call volume is heaviest. Um, during those hours, we might have uh, four or five teams available for response. And again, that's responding throughout the entire county. Uh, I believe now I'm going to um, pass it back to Frederick before we go into more uh, more details. Next slide, please. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Barb. Uh, I, my mute is off. Yes, you can hear me. Okay. Excellent. Just make, make sure it's awkward when you talk for three minutes and no one can hear you. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the intersectionality of the call center. And as previously uh, mentioned in my previous slide, we are one of the access points to mobile crisis. And so uh, I wanted to talk to you just for a moment about how the call center sort of fits into the crisis system. And we've had a lot of conversations about this and we really wanna make sure that we are breaking this down because this, we wanna demystify what the crisis system is because we wanna make it more palatable and more approachable for people to engage in it. Uh, so generally what happens is there's a see something, say something, right? We're very familiar with that. And so somebody would see something in our community uh, that, that someone could be a community member, uh, that could be a provider, that could be a crisis line, that could be 911, but someone sees something. And that seeing something translates into a call to say, hey, something has happened uh, and we need you kind of to, to look into that. The next piece of that is the triage place. And in the triage, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, based on the information that we gathered, based on the questions that we've asked, we need to make sure that we are going to recommend the, or we're going to take the most appropriate approach, whether that is the recommendation of what might be needed to really uh, provide the necessary supports, whether we're going to create a referral or whether we're going to deploy resources. And let me break those down uh, really, really quickly. So for the recommended services, this might be for somebody who's having a behavioral health concern, either for themselves or a loved one or someone in the community. And we're saying, okay, you know, there, there, there might be some options there. 
Uh, it, it doesn't seem like there's an immediate situation here. It doesn't seem like there's an immediate harm to self or others. And so maybe you can consider going to an urgent walking clinic or have you been with a provider before? Have you considered maybe going back or would you like some help trying to find a provider in your area? The referral piece, um, I'll just give an example. Let's say someone is uh, discharging from the hospital, psychiatric kind of hospital, and they're not necessarily ready to go back into the community, uh, but they're also ready to be discharged because it's not the appropriate level of care from the hospital. And so something like a respite where you have additional stabilization that could take place. Those are resources that we have that we would refer those individuals to the, the necessary level of care uh, to really match the need. That's that's the presentation. And lastly, we can also deploy resources. So in the event that someone is having a mental health emergency, in the event that somebody is having a behavioral health emergency, we can deploy resources. Uh, again, being one of the access points to the call center to mobile crisis. And let me just kind of touch on that deployed kind of box really quickly. It does have project respond. It has Portland police bureau and Portland street response. I, I just wanted to kind of highlight that Portland police bureau does not. It's not an absolute that they will go out. Uh, there are certain times where they will need to go out. For example, uh, to do a involuntary hold. Well, the police need to do some level of transportation to the hospital. So if you're going to do that, there's some processes that still need to be updated. If the goal is to try to minimize police contact. There are some statutes that are sort of in the way of that. So that, that might be something that we have to really look at. Um, but I just want to just give that just kind of disclaimer that the Portland Police Bureau is not guaranteed to go out, although there are times in which they do respond to calls with both Project Respond as well as Portland Street Response. So if you see something in the community, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I really want people to utilize the call center. So if you see something in the community, please call 503-988-4888. See something? say something, we will triage whatever is needed, and then we look forward to providing the adequate response or the, the needed response to really help uh, people in the situations that they might be in. Uh, so with that very, very, very brief overview there about how the call center interacts with the crisis system, uh, I'm going to um, send this back to Barb, and I think Barb's gonna give us a, an overview of Project Respond. And if you'd be so kind, if we could get the next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks again, Frederick. So as Frederick uh, discussed, the call center is a major source of referrals for Project Respond. This uh, graph just kind of gives that real simple uh, layout of how we get referred. So they either come from the Multnomah County Call Center or the Behavioral Health Call Center or through BOAC 911. Um, so calls that come to us through BOAC are calls that have gone through 911. Uh, police, ambulance, or fire have gone on scene and have determined that it is uh, more of a mental health situation and have then contacted us through BOAC for us to respond. So when we get those pages, uh, they're, they're pretty quick. We get uh, an, a name sometimes or we get an address to go to. Sometimes we get an officer cell phone to call back. We prioritize getting in our car and getting to those calls as soon as possible. We know law enforcement is already on scene and we want to get there and relieve them. We want to take over that call, allow them to go elsewhere, and then we can do our behavioral health intervention. Calls that come through the Behavioral Health Call Center, uh, we get we get the information from Frederick's team. We then call back the referent, make sure that we have accurate information, and discuss what our intervention is going to look like. So um, most of the calls that we're getting as a mobile crisis team are calls that are coming um, are not self-referred. They're calls that someone else is calling the call center or someone else called um, crisis or 911 uh, on their behalf. Uh, so we want to talk to that referent, find out what's going on, what they're hoping for, what the situation is, and then make that plan of response. Um, our goal in all of the interactions we have with individuals is ideally to help someone come up with a community plan where we're helping to stabilize and maintain them in the community. We do have the ability, as Frederick mentioned, to do um, involuntary transports to the hospital for further evaluation. We also sometimes recommend voluntary transport to the hospital, um, but really we're hoping to set up some sort of plan to help that individual stabilize in the community. We feel like that is the best option for most individuals. Um, so that might be any combination of uh, referrals and services and linkage and follow up by by our team. So our crisis team is not a one and done. Sometimes we only have one contact with an individual, but frequently we're doing follow up phone calls or follow up visits uh, in the days uh, following the initial contact. We also have our peer wellness specialists that we're referring to, our family crisis uh, clinicians, if it's a family or youth that we're seeing. And then we also make 
lots and lots of referrals to all those different kind of community sports, whether it's other mental health or behavioral health supports or sub, uh, services, substance use services, or sometimes it's really about um, mobilizing people's natural supports, their family, their friends, um, or helping to solve some basic need struggles, whether that's getting access to shelter or food or clothing or that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Oh, I think, am I passing to someone else? Sorry, I thought I, I was expecting a different slide there. It's okay. It's okay. I think that's that. That might be me, Barb. It's okay. We're, okay. We're, Sorry we're, about we're that. The, no, it's okay. We're, we've been doing tag team for the last couple of months. Don't even worry about it. Uh, so, before we get into the data, uh, I just want to take a moment just to kind of talk about 2020 and even 2021, but mainly 2020. Um, when we talk about the impact of, of COVID-19, because we talk about it, but we don't necessarily specify it. So I, I just want to create a, just a little bit of a funnel here because we know COVID kind of impacted a lot of things, but I want to talk more specifically about how it may have impacted crisis services uh, in 2020. Uh, so as you can tell, and my cat hasn't licked the top of my head, thank goodness for this particular meeting yet, uh, I am at home. And so in 2020, what we had to do is we had to move an entire call center from the call center to remote. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot. There was a lot of work that happened there. The other piece that people don't necessarily realize is that many of the calls that we get through the call center are from concerned citizens. They're people who see people. They're people who recognize people. And so when we have fewer people out and we have fewer people observing one another, we have fewer family members able to see one another so closely, it means that the calls that we were gonna get were going to drop a little bit. Because I think in the first maybe two to three months of COVID, there was really this panic of, I'm not going anywhere, man. <laughs> there was mandates and everything. So I think there was less interaction which means less observation, which means less see something, less say something. So I just, I wanted to throw that piece out there that the call volume, or at least some of the reports may have been impacted uh, by COVID-19 and people not interacting quite as much, thus the reporting may not necessarily have been as, as robust as it had been. The, the other part I just wanted to kind of talk about, and, and maybe Barb can speak to this a little bit more, is, is around mobile crisis. And I, I think when we think about COVID, we think about our individual restrictions, but we don't necessarily think about the other processes and the other parts that sort of had to re, uh, react to the system. And so with mobile crisis, what was sort of happening, and this was happening with Portland police as well, is, you know, um, they were trying to, or 911, sorry, they, they would try to call and say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's make sure that if we're going to be engaging here, it's both clinically indicated, there's a necessary need to do that, and then when there is a need to do that, that the, the, the precautions around physical distancing and around safety and around being trauma-informed are all in place. And so for the interventions that had to be uh, uh, done by mobile crisis, it had to be done in a way that was so very careful. And also those interventions may have been tad more complicated uh, because of all of the other pieces. Are there PP is there PPE there? Uh, do we go in one car as mobile crisis or do we take separate cars? There was a lot of logistical pieces that really needed to be worked out. So I just wanted to highlight that before we get into the data that call volume may likely have been impacted by people not interacting as much, therefore not seeing a, a enough. And, and the, especially in the early stages of, of COVID with mobile crisis, they had to be really, really careful uh, it, not just triaging in advance and making sure that interventions were necessary uh, to be done in person, but when they were done in person, uh, taking the, the care that was needed in order to make sure that we did a safe, trauma-informed uh, intervention uh, on behalf of mobile crisis. Uh, so I just want to kind of throw those two pieces out. I, I think I'm going to be kicking it back to Barb to do some of the data. Uh, so if you'd be so kind as to maybe to put up the next slide. Uh, and then Barb will kind of walk through a little bit of the data. Barb? Yes, thank you, Frederick. Um, and I think the, the information you just provided gives a really good framework for what we're seeing on this slide too. So this slide gives just a quick overview over the last three years, both the number of distinct clients that the team saw and also the total number of episodes. So as you can see, total between July 2017 and June of 2020, we saw 7,154 unduplicated individuals and had 9,515 episodes. Um, just a very quick explanation, that episode is every individual we see 
uh, we write an initial triage on. So we get that call from the call center or we get a call from BOAC and that, uh, that contact starts a triage for us on that individual. Um, we then do any combination of phone and face-to-face -face contacts following that triage um, and within a seven day period that constitutes an episode of care. So uh, you can see that uh, last year we did see a drop in our numbers and we do attribute that to uh, COVID. We saw a real reduction in referrals in late March, April and May um, of last year due to you know, what I believe Frederick just outlined um, in terms of the stay home orders and the lack of um, community um, oversight that was happening for people. Um, I will say that starting in July of this year, we saw a tremendous uptick in our numbers and that has continued through um, this entire fiscal year and we are looking at our numbers for this fiscal year to be um, higher than than any of those last three years. Next slide, please. So this slide speaks to what I just talked about a little bit in terms of the face-to-face um, -face and the phone interventions. You will see again uh, for last fiscal year, we had an increase in phone in interventions and a slight decrease in face-to-face. -face. And again, that was in response to the pandemic and that need to really be thoughtful in particular about what calls we could kind of support and manage doing ongoing phone work and what calls we really had to go out and see in person. We were very conscious of the fact that as a mobile crisis team, we um, did not want to be exposing people, especially vulnerable, vulnerable people in the community, excuse me, to anything that our staff might have been carrying. You know, we did not know if we were potential vectors of, of disease. So really considering all the angles, making sure that we were following all the protocols as closely as possible. Um, again, we see we expect you know our face to face numbers to go back up again this fiscal year and our numbers to be higher than ever. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide gives a real quick uh, overview of the um, race makeup of those that we've seen on the crisis team over the last three years. Um, you'll notice that we have left off uh, white identified clients, which make up about 50% of our total contacts and also the unknown category. Um, so this is a, a challenge that we face on a regular basis on the crisis team. We value the importance of knowing um, how someone identifies uh, both race, ethnicity, culturally, in order to make really good comprehensive support plans for individuals. Simultaneously, we see a lot of individuals in the community who are uh, very symptomatic, um, struggling with uh, many uh, situations and not able necessarily to participate in a conversation in which we can ask and get answers to uh, questions around race and ethnicity. Um, so we, we try to gather that information as best as we can. We are continuously exploring other ways to try to gather that information. Um, we see the value of it and we also want to make sure that we're not um, guessing or assuming uh, how someone might identify uh, during our interaction. So we do end up with a high percentage of unknowns. Next slide, please. A similar slide, this one shows um, the ethnicity categories. I also want to um, acknowledge with this slide that the ethnicity categories um, are a little limiting. Uh, and I just want to um, point out that we follow the state requirements around MOTS, uh, which is measures and outcomes tracking systems. So we are limited in, in terms of those categories based on what we have to supply to the state. Um, you know, if we expanded our categories beyond that, then we would have a reporting um, issue with how that's going forward. So unfortunately, those those are some of the limitations we have here. And again, similar limitation to the um, number of unknowns as we saw on the race slide. Next slide. Please. Can we pause there for a oh, second? Um, Commissioner Vega Peterson has a question. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I think the ethnicity slide partially answers it just because it was um, I was wondering about the the Latinx population, and this goes into it a bit. Um, but it really, but I'm just looking at the numbers here, so it's um, it's hard because it's not to scale with some of those other ones. So if you, if there's a way you could um, pr provide or share like more of the specific numbers around the um, the Latinx populations, that would be really helpful to me. Yes, I don't have that in front of me at the moment, but I would be happy to provide that information for you. Okay, thank you. All right, continue, Barb, thanks. Yes, no problem. Uh, next slide, please. 
so I really want to um, spend some time talking about this slide and just our uh, relationship with law enforcement and coordination with law enforcement, especially given some of your um, very valid and appropriate questions and concerns, Commissioner Myron. Um, so we truly believe that the best intervention to a behavioral health crisis is a behavioral health intervention. So clinician response to someone in crisis. Um, we also are going out on calls um, that span a, a variety of situations and symptoms and uh, behaviors. So we do respond to calls in which weapons are present. We do respond to calls in which someone is making viable threats of harm to themselves or someone else. Um, so we have to make a decision in those calls about whether or not um, we think law enforcement needs to be there for safety as well as uh, well for safety. So we would prefer to not take law enforcement with us, but sometimes we need to in order to make sure that we're able to contain the situation and really get the person safely into um, the next level of care. Uh, we don't always take law enforcement with us at the beginning of our call. So you'll see these numbers here in terms of the percentage of times that we have um, requested law enforcement when the call has come to us through the Multnomah County Call Center. So these stats weed out uh, calls that come from law enforcement and they're really just about that mobile crisis team and when we take law enforcement with us at the point of initial contact. Um, Sometimes we're taking them at the beginning, depending on that information we have. And again, the information we're looking at is, is there a weapon involved? Is there a viable threat of harm to self or the community? Um, is there a crime in progress? Um, other times law enforcement ends up on scene, uh, as Frederick noted, if we do an involuntary director's custody hold, uh, then AMR typically does the transport on those. However, uh, AMR requires law enforcement be present to help get the individual from wherever they might be uh, safely onto the gurney and therefore transported to the hospital. So if we call AMR to help with the transport, we also have law enforcement coming on scene. Um, if we call for a medical emergency that we're witnessing on scene, we get on scene, we notice someone's overdosing, um, then again, we're gonna end up with law enforcement on scene as well as, as AMR. When we are responding with law enforcement, we do everything we can um, to try to front load and plan and coordinate our response um, to be as supportive as possible, knowing that bringing law enforcement is likely um, or possibly going to cause uh, increased trauma for the individual we're going to see. So in those situations that we are bringing law enforcement up front, we meet with law enforcement beforehand, um, close to wherever we're responding, but not right at where we're responding so that we can have a quick conversation with them, um, talk about what's happening, why we've called them, what we're hoping for from them, and then go in with a planned response. So ideally we are um, coordinating and doing that again as respectfully as possible for the individual. Um, that might mean that, that I'm knocking on the door or the clinicians are knocking on the door and making first contact and law enforcement is kind of taking a, a, um, a side step. Um, in some situations, it might be that the situation is so unsafe that we need law enforcement to go in first, ensure that the scene is safe, um, that the individual is not um, posing a threat to themselves or us, and then we can do that assessment. Um, I also just want to note, um, I know you asked for three years of data. We did not start collecting this data around when we requested law enforcement until spring, early summer of 2019. So therefore I only have data um, for last fiscal year and this year uh, around this. You will see um, that it was much higher last year than it has been this year. And again, I believe that is um, directly related to COVID as we were prioritizing those calls in March, April, and May around what we were gonna respond to, what really couldn't wait, what couldn't be handled on the phone. Um, it makes sense that those calls we were responding to were the much more highly acute um, calls, the, the calls that really involved threats towards others, weapons, and that sort of thing. So therefore the amount of times that we were taking police during those months increased. Um, than what we typically see. Next slide, please. So these are um, our outcomes. So as I talked about earlier, you know, our hope and our plan and our, our intention is always to try to support the individual in the community. Um, we feel very good about that. We got 83% of our of the time, that's the outcome that we're able to come up with with individuals. Um, we do recognize that sometimes we have to do those involuntary holds. It's not our, uh, are, uh, we don't enjoy doing it. it it's very um, dramatic to everyone involved sometimes when we're doing those, um, but they are necessary um, and we do them about 11% of the time. 
I think the other really important number to notice on this slide is the jail number. So we work really hard to have those individuals um, we're having contact with not have a criminal or law enforcement outcome to the call. And we do very well at that. Um, very few, 0.5% over three years, um, which I think uh, on that handout, I think it gives you the totals, which is less than 60 individuals total over a three year um, period that we have worked with have ended up going to jail. And then I believe I'm passing it to Krista on the next slide. Oh, to Julie, sorry. Yep. So we have um, identified several gaps, barriers, and challenges, and we'll see them, but I, I think we can categorize them in three key points. One is, are we serving the right people? And how do we know that we're serving the right people? We've identified that we, we need to improve our capacity to serve uh, culturally specific um, populations, um, specifically assuring that the team has black um, and uh, Spanish speaking team members that can respond to those teams, as well as um, thinking about there's a we're continuously assessing how we're looking at the, the younger end of the age spectrum, children and youth as well as the older adult population. Do we have the right connections and building out those resources to serve those, those children and families and older adults that Project Respond is, is working on? So we see that as, as an area for an improvement. Another challenge is around data. And uh, Commissioner Vega-Peterson, you, you alluded to this, uh, looking at specifically the ethnicity data. And some of that is a challenge pre presented by um, we are required to use the state reporting system, which uses as a specific category of, of um, ethnicity, but it's limited, not necessarily accurate because it is a federal requirement. So it's, we need to figure out how to navigate that without um, cre increasing reporting burden, but make sure, making sure that we're gathering that information. But also along those lines within data, is you know uh, gathering demographic data. Sometimes that's a real challenge when you're meeting with, you know, someone who is ex in crisis and their family, and you know, stopping and pausing and saying, "So, by the way, how do you identify?" is not always an easy transition. So, uh, Project Respond errs on the side of not collecting rather than assuming, but we do need to improve how we gather that so we can better use that information to drive service delivery. Um, along those lines, we gather a lot of, you know, just the, the hard numbers um, as a put, you know, the, the quantitative data. But I don't think that accurately tells the whole story. So we also are assessing how do we, how can we capture more qualitative data that helps us to have a, a fuller idea of what is really happening as opposed to we showed up, we met with three people, we made two referrals and we had five follow ups. Um, you know, I know the documentation captures that, but there's got to be a different way. So we want to figure out how to improve that. And then finally, which we'll speak to coming up, has to do with response times. Um, our state contract um, requires that mobile response in an urban area arrive within an hour, which seems like a tremendous amount of time. Um, but, uh, and we meet that target 94% of the time, there, ha there are some challenges and we'll speak to that. But there's a, a range of things that impact that, including covering a wide geographic space. You know, they're not traveling with sirens and, and lights to get there quickly. And there's a certain amount of coordination and, and data uh, and information gathering um, that needs to happen before the team even rolls, which you know, slows things up. But we recognize that for that person who is experiencing this crisis or the family that is waiting, every minute seems like forever. So we are interested in figuring out how to make those improvements. So those are three key areas that we are looking at as gaps, challenges, and barriers. Um, and then I will pass it on over to Krista. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, Chair and commissioners, and thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is Krista Jones, and I'm the senior manager of the community mental health program within the behavioral health division. Today, I'm going to be talking about performance management um, of crisis services. As a local mental health authority, behavioral health is required to ensure that crisis services follow standards that are set by the state. Thank you so much for changing the slide. Services must be immediately available and include mental health crisis assessment, triage, and intervention services. 
Services must be available 24 seven with face to face or telephone screening. So in addition to the telephone line services provided by Multnomah County Behavioral Health Call Center, crisis services must be delivered in community based settings, such as in the individual's home and surrounding community, which is done by Project Respond. The Oregon Health, or, pardon, the Oregon Administrative Rules and the Behavioral Health Division outline performance metrics as well as reporting requirements. We embed these standards into the contracts that we have with Cascadia, who is the mobile crisis provider. And Cascadia submits these reports throughout the year, which are listed on the slide. Um, and these reports are then reviewed and analyzed. Next slide, please. Thank you. In the next few slides, I'm going to be discussing the goals and provide an evaluation of the performance of these services. So for the first goal, crisis services are immediately available for adults and children in crisis. Um, our, our target or expectation for this is 3000 annual episodes, and this was met in FY 19 and 18. Um, and looking at the data for fiscal year 20, however, reporting shows that the year started off lower than um, in the past and remained somewhat steady throughout the year. In April of 2020, when the impact of COVID was really starting to be more pronounced in our community, Project Respond experienced nearly 34% decrease from the same time in 2019. However, by July 2020, Project Respond experienced an increase of 32% um, open episodes compared to the same month in 2019. For fiscal year 2020, we are projecting that there will be over 3,500 episodes being opened, so more than we've ever seen in the past. This is aligned with what we know in terms of the immediate and delayed impacts of COVID-19, of the public health crisis of racism and other community crisis. The spirit of goal number two is to promote follow-up services for individuals to, who, to ensure that they are connected to the appropriate services following a crisis. The target goal is 1.3 um, contacts per individual and Project Respond exceeds this year after year. Follow-up contacts include speaking to in individuals directly, but also coordinating on their behalf. Across the three years, the average number of, of follow-up contacts was 4.6 per individual. And remember, the target is 1.3. Next slide, please. Oh, Krista, can you pause for a second? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Myron has a question. Thank you. Um, just uh, thank you, Krista. Uh, for, for goal one, I'm trying to understand so the, that the crisis services are immediately available and um, we we target 3000 annual episodes. I'm I, I just I guess I don't under where where is the 3000 annual episodes like it seems like if we have fewer episodes that that should be a good like doesn't this incentivize having more I'm not sure I understand the target of 3,000, um, like where that comes from that and, and how that measures whether crisis services are immediately available or not. May I jump in on this? I think, yes. you know, thinking about the overall thing. So we're assuming, you know, starting at the call center with over 70,000 calls a year. Some of them are going to require, and this is more about population. You know, what what project respond in the call center does is, you know, they don't prevent behavioral health crises. That's part of the broader system of care. And with our increasing population, we anticipate this is a fairly steady number, but about 3000 calls a year is the target name per our contract with the state. And that's, you know, less than 5% of the calls are we actually rolling out with a physical behavioral health intervention. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like a lot, but for our county of our size and the population, I mean, that's kind of, you know, anticipated volume. I think the, the greater challenge to me, if I was going to be asking the question is, you know, specifically around COVID. You know, why did we see a decrease? And, and I know we're going to speak to that later, but we know that we have actually seen an increase in acuity and behavioral health crises. And are they finding the right place to access help? And I think that's that's the greater challenge to me is how are they finding the right way to to getting connected? Um, does that address your question at all, Commissioner? You know, I think and no, I, 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 may I, I may have just mis misunderstood. misunderstood. Um, and I'm hearing myself echo. I don't know if others are. Okay, now. <laughs> Phew. Um, um, I, I think, I, think I, I, 
I was confusing a couple of things. Couple I, of I things wasn't that... actually saying that we need that we need to somehow set the target less, but I, I was conflating that target with sort of showing an outcome that crisis services are immediately available. Like I, it's a never mind. I withdraw the question. Still valid. Thank Sorry you, Commissioner. That. Um. If um, when someone else is talking, you could put your microphone on mute, it'll reduce the echo. Thank you. Shall I proceed? All right. Yep, please keep going, Krista. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we are on slide 18 now, if you, if you will. Um, in looking at the um, goal number three, which is to minimize response time and monitor disposition of each unique client served. Um, for this goal, we look at the average elapsed response time from the time that the referral is made until face-to-face -face contact with the client is achieved. The goal for this is less than 60 minutes, which is a standard set by the state um, of Oregon for urban areas, as Julie mentioned. In fiscal year 18, the response time was based on the number of minutes between the dispatch to the arrival on scene. With this metric, the average response time was 32 minutes. In fiscal year 2019, however, the state changed the reporting parameters to what they are today, which is the amount of time between dispatch and face to face. Um, and with that, the average time um, became 52 minutes in FY19 and 48.5 minutes in um, FY20, sorry, fiscal year 20. Data shows a steady increase in episodes where the response time exceeded 60 minutes, but overall project respond meets this goal by 94% of the time, as Julie mentioned. The most pronounced increase was seen in the spring and summer of 2020 which coincides with the beginning of COVID pandemic and the anti-racism demonstrations. What we know is that in um, when, de when the response time does exceed 60 minutes, there is a percentage of that, a small percentage, uh, 1.5, where um, there are multiple dispatches, meaning that more calls come in than the team can respond to simultaneously. However, the team continues to coordinate with, with the call center to address the need, and the call center may refer the person to urgent walk-in, to the emergency department, or uh, for law enforcement to do a, a, a wellness check or a welfare check when needed. In some cases, um, around 3.2% of the time, um, the standard response time is exceeded due to known safety concerns. Um, and then in other times, the person cannot be found by uh, Project Respond or the partners. Um, in a smaller percentage, so less than 1% of the time, um, there is needed a uh, time to coordinate a plan. And so then that extends the time just naturally um, for Project Respond to be able to get a, have a face to face with that client. In terms of COVID-19 impact, we've addressed part of this, but wanted to make sure that we kind of understood that sometimes um, COVID-19 had an impact on, on the ability to get to meet that metric to get to on scene and face to face within 60 minutes. There was reduced staffing and difficulty recruiting behavioral health professionals, which we've seen across the system. Um, also, uh, staff were driving from different start locations and then driving separately due to physical distancing, which increased travel time in general to get on onto the scene. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, for goal number four, um, while this is not a specifically a mobile crisis service, this does speak to the relationship that exists with many of the elements of the crisis system. Cascadia's um, emergency department diversion team works with hospitals and, um, and children and adult clients to assist them in accessing outpatient supports. This performance measure is under review because we really want to take the time to um, set a goal and standard that really demonstrates successes and gaps. So looking at the three years um, across that we're reporting on, this team, the ED diversion team, achieved the goal of seeing the 250 clients, which is what the goal is, um, in fiscal years 18 and 19. However, once COVID hit, as many of you know, that the hospitals um, had restrictions on who can come on site, including visitors and, and um, professionals. And so fewer patients were referred into the program. But if we're looking at referrals, we realize that that may not be the best metric. Um, instead, we should be looking at how many individuals were diverted after they were referred. Next slide, please. So continuous quality improvement is very important to us. Um, we wanna make sure that um, we understand the effectiveness and we also can address the gaps as needed. Based on the current metrics that I just described, mobile crisis services are effective, but we know that this isn't the full picture or always a shared perspective. Um, currently, we have uh, received client feedback through our complaints and grievances line. And in the last three years, we, re we received three reports. Two of them were compliments and one was a, a, a complaint about the system as a whole. 
again, we know that this is not the full picture of the community's um, perspective of mobile crisis services. The community needs a system that is more sensitive to cultural needs, that responds more immediately to their concerns, and that reduces law enforcement engagement. We also need to expand services and data collection strategies to better meet the needs of youth and older adult community and to increase culturally specific services to address the needs of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. We need to collaborate across systems to share data to improve services and to create mechanisms um, to gather feedback directly from clients um, in a very active way and not in a, in, a, in a reactive way as we do currently. These efforts are really important to us and we know that they're really important to our community. I'm going to pass it back to Frederick to talk about alternative strategies. Thank you, Krista, and I'm going to try to be a little bit more efficient. I tend to get all three folksy because I'm pretty passionate about this work, but let me let me try to get a little more focused. Uh, I, I think we talked earlier just about, you know, police involvement and when we're talking about quality improvement. It, it continues to come back to evolution, but quality improvement is a science. And part of that science is being data driven. So one of the things that we did was we, we decided to look at what are, are there other states that have mobile crisis teams? And so we saw, we saw that we were one of 17 states uh, that actually has a mobile crisis team and actually has a mobile crisis kind of initiative. And so when we're thinking about quality improvement and we're thinking about evolution, it's really cool to know that we are trailblazing. Hopefully I won't get any kind of trademark infringement on that, but we're trailblazing in, in the place of mobile crisis and, and, and really doing what we need to do to evolve our system to fit the needs of the community. Uh, I think people are pretty familiar with the CAHOOTS model. I think people are getting more familiar with our model through this presentation and through the longevity of our crisis system. Uh, but I think one of the things that I would just say um, is that we have one crisis system, and that is the safety net for everyone in our community. And so all the systems, whether it is Portland Street Response, whether it's the call center, whether it's um, BOIC, we, we are one vehicle. And if you think about a vehicle, if you took the, the, the favorite parts from every vehicle, Maseratis, your Ferraris, and you were going to build a single car based on the best parts you could find, you wouldn't be able to build the car because those parts are not compatible. And so as we're talking about our crisis system, it's going to be really important that we're thinking about what is our existing system and how do pieces sort of fit? Because again, our safety net can't have holes. Everyone needs to find refuge and some level of sanctuary in our system. That is our BIPOC community. That is our AAPI community. That's our LGBTQ uh, community. Uh, deaf with a capital D, hard of hearing and hard of hearing populations. There should be no population that we cannot serve in our crisis system. And the best way to do that is when we accept that our vehicle for crisis is one vehicle. And we really need to think about the people in our communities, how we best serve them. And how we both uh, and how we synergize all of our resources uh, to achieve that particular aim. Uh, so with that, and it's hard for me to cut myself off because I, I love this work and I love public service. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to hand this back to Krista, and then I will ask uh, for one last time. Or Julie. The slide deck. Or Julie. Or Julie. My apologies. Yep. Sorry. Back to Julie. Sorry about that, Julie. All right. And on to the next slide. So, you know, some of this, I think you've started to hear, we have recommendations. What are those things that we need to continue to improve and pay, paying attention to? And they're listed out before you, but they include um, increasing racially and culturally responsive services, as well as age appropriate services from the call center to project respond. We need to continue to improve that. Um, we want to promote crisis services that reduce law enforcement response as that is appropriate, as well as remind law enforcement to engage behavioral health more often. Um, I think there's some, some opportunities to continue to build that relationship so that they even, you know, not just 911, but a street officer feels comfortable saying, you know what, I think we should be calling in behavioral health. Uh, we want to continue to collaborate and partner with our providers across the continuum of care that are racially specific that are age appropriate and also engaged in these new initiatives, including the planning for 988, Portland Street Response, and all those other things. Every time we add in something, you know, to this car using building on Frederick's model, you know, we want to make sure that it's the right piece and it doesn't, you know, add, you know, a big, you know, I don't know, 
four wheel drive set of wheels to our Mas Maserati, because that's just going to be clunky. So we want to figure out how do we do this well for our county while embracing new new strategies. Um, we are um, also wanting to look at those options to improve response times. What does that look like? Is it about the number of teams? Is it about where they're located? Is it having more hubs that they're you know assigning people differently? We want to figure out what is the best best model to do that. We're also looking at continuing improvement regarding data, both how we collect it and how we use that to make program improvements. Um, and within that, creating opportunities for consumer voice to be heard to um, improve services and outcomes. You know, and, and so not just the data, but real people telling us about their experience and what they would like to see. And um, finally, we're going to be looking at all the funding. 988 is going to pre create some opportunities, and we want to make sure that those opportunities are directed well to support what we need in our system to fill in gaps, not just require new elements. So, um, and with that, I will pass over to Krista. Thank you, Julie. This is my last slide, so I wanted to thank you all for um, this this opportunity. We wanted to provide a comprehensive response to um, your question, Commissioner Meyer, and so we appreciate this time. Um, I just wanted to talk uh, briefly about the mobile crisis and Portland uh, Street response. Portland Street response, along with the call center and project respond and other programs, they all address unique needs and have a place in the system of care, and we are thrilled with the opportunity to be able to work and partner. Um, we want to thank the city of Portland and Robin Burek for um, including us in a lot of conversations and discussions um, in the planning phases. This really allowed us to identify the best approach so that we can work together to serve our community, um, given that our unique roles and our unique positions. As you know, um, Portland Street Response is a pilot and it's currently focused on the Lentz neighborhood. Their focus is on supporting the houseless and those in behavioral health crisis. Portland Street Response supports community situations with lower acuity. So these are lower distress um, situations and needs, whereas Project Respond responds to higher acuity. So higher distress and situations with higher volatility. This is one reason uh, why instances of law enforcement co-response will be significantly lower for Portland Street Response than they will be for Project Respond. Additionally, Portland Street Response cannot place individuals on director's custody holds, which we've mentioned is the legal mechanism used to transport individuals in acute psychiatric crisis to the hospital for evaluation. But Project, Project Respond can do this, um, and they do this in order to support the safety of the individual. 32% on average situations that mobile crisis services and Project Respond responds to involve supporting individuals who are at risk for houselessness or who are experiencing houselessness. And so this collaborative relationship between Portland Street Response and Project Respond can re, um, will, will be most significant in working with this population. Our alignment plan includes um, a referral pathway where the call center and Project Respond can refer clients to Portland Street Response and also provide community support to them. Additionally, Portland Street Response can refer to the call center and to Project Respond for those cases where the client is in increased distress or has higher level of symptoms. Since mid-February, the call center has documented 25 instances of referring Portland Street Response or educating callers on this service. And Portland Street Response and Project Respond, those are kind of getting tongue twisted, um, have also worked together to um, coordinate to address the needs um, and, and just to make sure that communication is really active. Um, we are continue to be in active communication with Robin's team and with Port, uh, Project Respond, and we're going to continue to identify new ways uh, to support our efforts to serve our community, including identifying ways that we can partner um, for new initiatives, such as Behavioral Health Resource Center that's coming online in 2022. Yay, I'm going to pass over to Julie. <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, you know, our commitment is, as I said at the beginning, what good will it do? How will it matter in the people in the lives of the people that we serve? And we hold that first. Um, there's certainly some good things. I and mean, when we can champion and say, look, we're one of the first mobile response teams in the country. And I think one of the challenges is that a whole lot of people don't even know that we exist. And I think we could do better on marketing. I think we could do better at telling that story so that the city of Portland and Multnomah County um, doesn't hold on to this narrative that we don't have behavioral health options. We also need to be realistic in what we can do. 
And we know that there's a whole uh, continuum that needs to be filled out to be able to better support our, our citizens and our community members so that they can live well. Um, we are interested in collaboration. We're interested in partnership and we're interested in, in continuing to learn and improve. We know, we know we're not perfect. We also know that what's, what we do can be really good, can be really positive. So uh, you know, we're excited to have a partner like Barb and her team. Um, we're also excited to be able to have the support of the Board of County Commissioners um, and Chair Kifori and Commissioner Myron because your voice matters. Um, and it, it makes a difference in the lives of the people we serve. Um, and then as we move forward, we want to open up for, and we want to thank you for being able to share all this, but also be able to respond to any questions, comments uh, that you might have, and whether that means we answer that now or bring, get you back some additional information. Um, I also have to say one thing before we jump into that, kind of building on something Frederick said at the very beginning, because I know you all get emails from people all over the county saying, this is going on, I got a thing. And I want to encourage you all, the quickest thing to do is to forward that email to our call center or because they're the ones who can triage and, and help find the right resource for those folks. You know, I'm happy to be a liaison, but the quickest thing is go ahead and email that to them and they will help find what needs to get done. So with that, do you have any questions, comments, thoughts, things we can respond to? I am sure that we do. Sure that we, do. Uh, we will start uh, with Commissioner start. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for this presentation. It was really in, in depth and I'm still kind of trying to, to process it. Uh, but I did have a couple of questions. Uh, going back to like slide uh, six, uh, I guess what I'm wondering, I have a lot of questions uh, from an East County perspective. So I know that we're talking about um, the Portland Street response. So my concern is, well, but what about the cities of Gresham, Fairview, Troutdale, Wood Village? So could somebody talk to me about how we interact, especially uh, with the police response, if it's Gresham police or Multnomah County? And just basically like, how are these, are, are we limited uh, by like the Portland Street response. I don't think they go out to East County. I'm not sure. Why don't I start this and I'll pass it to Barb. Um, so one of the things that, you know, they have, you know, Krista had alluded to the heat map and we know that we do have a fairly good distribution and specifically concentrated around the 12 mile corner area. There's a pretty good concentration of calls in that area. Um, Project Respond also has relationships with the county sheriff Gresham police and so on. So Barb, do you want to pick up from there? Yeah, I'll just yeah. say we, um, our response is project response is the same, no matter where someone in the county is. So we go out to East County all of the time. We, in fact, just are working on having uh, an office more out in the Rockwood plate, uh, Rockwood area for staff to utilize too, so that our response time out there improves. Um, we've also done a lot of work with Gresham police over the last few years. So um, I don't know what slides were numbered what, but on that initial kind of uh, pictograph of the project response services, we do have um, a co-location team in Gresham that actually uh, was able to get a second grant this fall and just expanded to have two clinicians out there co-responding with law enforcement. So that's separate than what we've been talking about today, um, but definitely we work in coordination with, with them as well. Um, so we do, we provide quite a bit of response out in, in East County and in, and in Gresham, um, but no, there is no Portland Street response um, out there, but uh, we utilize all the other resources that we can get our hands on. Okay, great. No, I appreciate that, Barb. I guess the second question is that, do we know, like, are we able to follow, you know, like what I hear is we don't have enough, um, you know, recovery and treatment center. So, well, well, it sounds like you are able to refer folks, but if there's not the services on the other end, can you just kind of talk to me about that situation? I can. I'm looking at everyone else. Do you guys want me to go or? <laughs> Barb, why don't you start and then I'll chase it. Okay. Um, so I, I would say across the board, we don't have enough of everything. 
Um, and that isn't to say that there aren't wonderful services out there doing lots of wonderful work and we do lots of referrals and try to connect people to what we can. Um, in my ideal world, there would be enough services and preventative care out there that I would actually be out of a job and not be needed. Um, but that's that's not where we're at. So I think, um, you know, we're constantly looking, the, the services constantly are changing and evolving themselves too. So we do spend a lot of time um, we have regular presentations for our staff from all different community providers to try to make sure that we are up to date on what is available and how to best um, access those resources for individuals. And it's another area where our peer wellness specialists also do a tremendous amount of amazing work helping to connect individuals um, to ongoing services, but um, we could always use more. So following that, I mean, one of the things, of course, we know about Measure 110 and how that is intended to increase you know, treatment access. And it's being, you know, the, the state oversight commission is going to kind of revamp that a little bit to expand it from just a 24 hour center located somewhere, which is what was in the legislation to really a broader treatment access network that will include outreach engagement referral and one of our hopes as the county is to partner with specifically our smaller um, grassroots organizations, peer run organizations, black, indigenous and other people of color to stand them up because they have a deeper reach and a more trusted reach. Um, but we do, I mean, we, we recognize that lack. Measure 110 is going to bring some in, but the offset set of that is that it actually compressed the funding for behavioral health services that was previously funded through the marijuana tax. So there's there's a lot of dancing happening at the state level, and I, I know we appreciate your advocacy and support to help balance that out. Um, the demand is high. We want to make sure that we have the right services too. I think sometimes, uh, you know, no fault to anybody. We respond to the crisis without taking time to assess what is going to be the best option. And so, you know, one of my goals and our team's goal is to really kind of step back out and say, all right, do some some real mapping to say what is where. Where are the true gap gaps and how can we as a county stand up alongside those folks to encourage increased services in those areas, whether that is supporting other organizations or talking with you all to target some procurements to increase that. And Julie, um, can you all hear me okay? This is Ebony. Yeah. Um, so what I will also add is that um, it's important for us to remember too that we are, um, I think what, year two of CCO 2.0. And so um, Multnomah County Behavioral Health Division is no longer the administrator of the Behavioral Health um, Medicaid um, insurance benefit. And um, as the local mental health authority, when it comes to our crisis services, we have the responsibility to assuring that we have um, a broad enough uh, resource for all residents in Multnomah County, whether they have insurance, they're underfunded, or whether they have commercial insurance. Um, but I say that to say, when we think about our actual treatment services, we know that you know we are limited by the funding, and so. Also, as the local mental health authority and the community mental health program, we are in constant conversation with our local CCO as well as the state around the need for continuing to expand um, treatment services, whether that's mental health, uh, SUDS, substance use, and or co-occurring levels of care. Thank you, Ebony, and all. I, I appreciate. I just, uh, I mean, I think you all are knee deep in the work of trying to figure out where those bottlenecks and gaps are, and there's no simple, clear answer. So um, I, I realize it's very, very complex, but I appreciate your response. The other question I had is more logistics. Uh, so is the current call center, is that located at the Yeon building? Uh, and if not, tell me where it is. Uh, and then I guess, what are your plans uh, post pandemic or hopefully we're, you know, like we're all trying to figure out like, how are you gonna bring folks back? Uh, it sounds like it's been a little, a little bit of a logistic nightmare having people work from their homes. So you could just maybe talk to me about how you're gonna bring folks. Frederick, so you wanna start I'll that? Oh, Ebony will go. It. So, you know, I want to just um, applaud um, the division, specifically Krista and Frederick,
for working early in the pandemic to find a solution working with um, Tracy Massey's team and finding a, a solution where we could continue to assure that we had uh, the, the crisis behavioral health crisis call center available. So being able to say that we went remote during the pandemic is amazing, and that had to take a lot of thought, intention, and strategy to make sure that we were mitigating any issues because we know the uh, consequence if that service is not available. That said, um, you know, I specifically want to highlight that we are following all guidance from um, our local public health authority uh, and also, the, you know, the chair uh, when it comes to how and when we begin to look at how do we return to uh, the EON building to operate all our call center. And so, you know, I know that we are in preliminary high-level conversations around what does the future of um, in-person or office-based work look like. And so very, very, very preliminary conversations. And so I just want to highlight that, you know, that will be done under the guidance of our local public health authority, the chair, when we get our new COO. Um, so I just want to put that technical element out there. Thank you, Ebony. I, I appreciate that. Uh, that's all the questions I have. I just wanted to thank uh, each and every one of you for your your expertise and your heart and your compassion uh, to serve others. Clearly, uh, this is so important, uh, not only to the county and our community, but I can see it's very important to you each as individuals. And so just thank you for caring about others and for you know, bringing your best selves. This is not, especially when there's limited options and sometimes we can see what we think is the right thing to do. But the reality is, is a lot of times we don't have the resources. So I just wanna thank you for your, your commitment to this work. It's important and it is meaningful. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to start off by thanking um, Ebony and Julie and Krista and Barb and Frederick for this really wonderful presentation. Um, I learned a lot from from all of this information, and um, it's been great to get this in depth look on how um, you know our behavioral health call center is working and how the mobile um, response. Um, and the mobile crisis um, is is working here for Multnomah County. Um, and I think you guys did such a good job. I was like scrolling down some questions and like, you know, and then you guys would be answering them on the next slide. So I really, so thank you for anticipating those questions. Um, but I did have a couple others um, that you, um, that, that came up. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things that you said, um, Julie, towards the end was about like better marketing. And I have to say like, as, as Frederick, as we were talking about the, the number to call, I was updating my phone because I still had it in there as like the Multnomah County mental health number. And I realized it was actually so much more. And I don't think people in the community know that. I don't think that they um, realize that if they see somebody in crisis, that this is the number that they should call or can call as an alternative to calling law enforcement. And so I do think that we need to do a better job of getting that message and that information out there. And, you know, and, and so that was like, so so I think that's really important because um, this is something that is a resource and should be a resource that people know about. Um, and then it also brought up like, um, and I appreciate the slides that you had that showed where mobile crisis services and the call center works in the continuum of the different, um, different providers. And it just feels like that it's, it is a disjointed system in some ways of the responses and, and where people can, where people go and who responds and, and what responds is, and just the fact that we have, you know, project respond, which is a certain level of acuity, but then we have the Portland street response, which is going to be a different level. Of, I mean, it's getting, it seems like that is adding additional complexity to, to a system that's already not as resourced and robust as it should be. So, you know, this is, so that's, it's just raising a lot of, of questions for me and a lot of areas that, you know, we need to have good conversation and coordination, I think, across, um, across the different levels of government um, for this. And I, and I, but I do, you know, I've been, I, Chair, I appreciate um, the comments that you had at the beginning of this about um, Robert Delgado and um, the shooting there, because 
I think when um, when something like that happens in our community, all of us are asking the questions of what could have been differently and how could we have responded to this in a way that didn't result in a loss of life. And the fact that, you know, and it's a, and it's a hard question because, um, you know, I, I, I know that Portland Street response was like, you know, the mayor said they don't respond if there's a if there's a gun, and it was it was really interesting to hear that project respond does. But I think that um, in those situations, you want to be you want to respond with the care and the and the preparation that you need to go into those situations. But the fact was, it wasn't a real gun. So how do you how do we change the dynamic of that situation where um, where we're recognizing the severity of it before something lethal happens. And I think that's on all of us to, to think about those questions and think about our role in, in um, setting up better systems and better responses for that. So I just, I think this was incredibly timely and incredibly important. And I just wanna um, reiterate with Commissioner Stegman says that this is, you know, that I appreciate all of you and all of the work that you do and what you're doing for our community. So thank you so much for, for all the time today. Commissioner. Thank you all um, so much uh, today. And Julie, Krista, Frederick, Barb. Um, Frederick, it was just great to kind of meet you and see you. And you did an awesome job, or to see you. And um, Barb, it's wonderful to see you again. And um, you know, this, is, this issue is um, near and dear to my heart for so many reasons. Uh, in the emergency department, obviously, we um, encounter people who are in behavioral health crisis. We often will see them. They will be brought in by law enforcement, or they will be accompanied by Project Respond, or you know, or they won't have anyone. And sometimes they get wonderful care, like Julie described with that um, person in the beginning, um, and warm handoffs. Uh, most often, unfortunately, very little of that happens. Um, and so this is something that is is deeply, this is, um, is something I've been working on for a very long time. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I um, appreciate Commissioner Vega Peterson's bringing up uh, a lot of that, that element of the seeming sort of disjointedness and lack of uh, sort of, you know, like what is, what is the right thing and where and, um, I just wanted to mention that in 2019 in September, um, uh, I pushed for a sequential intercept mapping SIM process as part of the Portland Street uh, response sort of overarching, you know, as they were like forging ahead, wanted to say, wait a second, what's the, what is the landscape here? Because it seems like there's a lot going on. We don't want to just add something to the mix without understanding the complexity. And so um, we convened this through uh, LIPSIC uh, and uh, the goal was to develop a sort of comprehensive map of touch points and services and processes and how to address mental health crises and divert people with mental health crises or co-occurring substance use disorders toward different levels of service. And so, Portland Fire and Rescue and PPB and BOEC and our own health department, um, Ebony and DCJ and the um, joint office and street routes. So many people were there to do this mapping, um, including advocates and peers familiar with the existing response systems. And the takeaway, I, I can um, send you all the draft report, um, but takeaways were there were an incredible number of people doing exceptional work on that front line every single day in the most difficult of circumstances to help people who are in crisis and most vulnerable. And the system was so complex that it was difficult to even evaluate how services are coordinated within that system, especially if someone is in crisis. And what can be done to street, you know, the questions then how for how can we identify the gap, streamline the system, et cetera, make it more effective? And of course, COVID hit. Um, but as that work is underway, we're adding 988, we're adding Portland Street Response, um, we're adding another outreach team from DCJ. So what's like 
how does that fit together to me is is sort of the most important question. How can we all be uh, ensuring that we are having a functional system in responding to crisis? And so there's some, you know, things we can do with with like our current program. I, you know, I I personally am as an ER doctor. I don't consider an hour a crisis response. That's through no fault of anyone here. But we need to reconsider what the timing in response to crisis is. Um, right now, as I understand it, we're centralized at uh, one place. So wherever you call in the county, you have to get there from this one place. And, you know, I like the idea of spreading out into quadrants as you, you know, as you, um, one of you mentioned. Um, some of the goals are okay, but the, the parameters to meet those goals don't make sense. So how do we both look at individual programs and whether we're using our resources in the most effective way to meet what the goal is of the program and how is that fitting with into this larger, very complex system as a whole so that we're optimizing that as well. And um, I uh, really appreciate um, the information today, all of the presentation here, all of the work that all of you are doing and look forward to you engaging in those questions um, as we move forward. So thank you. And thank, I'd like to add my thanks to all of you. I know this is the first time that um, I think you've all been together to give this presentation. Well, some of you are, are pretty new, but the first time we've heard this presentation. So I just wanna say thanks. It was really um, thorough. I feel like you anticipated everyone's questions before they asked them as commissioner. The Commissioner Stegmer, Commissioner Baker Peterson said. So um, it was really thorough. I know that this is um, something that we will want to have continued conversations about, um, especially as we try to look at, as we talked about, measure 110 and the effects and how Portland Street responds as it, as it enlarges its territory, how it fits in with, with these programs, and then ultimately how we make sure that um, more tragedies like what happened last Friday don't occur in our community. So thank you again, everyone. Um, and then I think. Uh, before we actually formally end this uh, meeting, uh, Commissioner Stegman had something that she wanted to bring up real quick, but thanks to the rest of you for your time today. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanted to mention that I am circulating a letter around something called Prosperity 1000, or it could be known as Prosperity 2000. It's House Bill 2820 called Oregon's Workforce Solution. And it will create a program to provide career coaching, training, and related support from anywhere from one to 2,000 Oregonians impacted by the COVID-19 economic crisis to re-career into high-wage, high-demand occupations. What's really neat about this program is that it leverages uh, money uh, for SNAP recipients who can then receive training and placement into middle income jobs. So it would generate a $5 million federal match. So I uh, just wanted to let you all know that letter will be circulating and uh, hopefully we could all sign on. And this was, uh, this is something that Representative Reardon has been fighting for, for at least three, maybe four years. And uh, I can't think of a more important time, uh, especially during the pandemic for us to rally around this and hopefully get it across the finish line. Thank you. Right, thank you. So you'll be circulating that around to our offices. Great. Thanks, Commissioner Stegman. I know that you've been a champion of this issue for year, several years as well. So I wanna thank you for your work. Anybody else have anything before we sign off? All right. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have no further business, but we will be back together here in virtual TV land th Thursday morning at 9.30.